and you can see what there we go. Um, and I, I am not quite done with Chris and Deborah. I'm just about there, but not fully done with that one. Um, so what, which order did you want to talk about them in? And now I've lost you. Uh-oh. Is that me? I heard a little snippet of you. Hmm. Maybe my phone would be more reliable. Do you mind if I call in that way? Not at all. And now I hear okay. you again. I'll do that real quick. There we go. Hi. Cool. Okay. Mm. Technical difficulties here. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Um, so you said you're still completing the Chris and Deborah conversation? Yeah, but I've got a bunch of stuff on them, so I'm happy to talk about it. I, I feel like there's just going to be a little bit more added to the conversation, but it was yeah. very, it was really geeky. Like, like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was sort of an alpha, uh, a conversation between alpha geeks. It was interesting. Yeah, I know. I think that not being um, especially familiar with the AI field, it felt, it felt like I wanted to have a to-do list of all of the articles that they mentioned to read and <laughs> research papers. Um, before I could really re-listen to the conversation, even though I understood the concepts behind it. Um, and it was very fascinating, especially the, the ideas yeah. around um, the of, um, of AI as a system. It wasn't being treated with regulation like software or even like he gave the example of cars would be. Right. Um, and so saying like, okay, we might not know how to regulate this. It's not gonna look like how we regulate other things, but what is the structure for it? Cause no, no regulation is not a solution. And yeah. the data is not just data, data is still selective um, and tells a story. So that was, I, th I found that part really fascinating as a concept, even though I would love to read all the articles and research papers they mentioned um, yeah. and, in and support also, of thoughts. And also the thought that like a car, a car doesn't inherently capture your personal data. A car is mm -hmm. just a car. In the worst of cases, if you have GPS, it tells you where, what addresses you stopped at. That's like, you know, that's it. And, and maybe modern cars have open microphones and they're spying on us. But, but really that like the degree of personal data that we're divulging inside of Facebook and Google is like crazy. And I think yeah. Facebook more than Google because Google is like, um, well, maybe your, your Gmail, but they're not really looking at your mail, at your, at your messages. Uh, yeah. But, but I, I just learned recently that there's such a thing as a lawsuit for who searched for these terms. Sorry, not a lawsuit. Um, mm. It's a subpoena. So Google can be served by, I don't know who has the rights to do this, but law enforcement agencies can serve Google with a subpoena that says, give us the IDs of all the, I think the IDs, I'm not sure, of all the people who search for these particular terms. Wow. And that's scary to me because that I'm, makes curious, really I'm scared of being curious about something that you don't, under, don't know about, even if you're not. And you end not, up on an FBI list. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so that was like one of the kinds of implications that I think are really interesting here uh, yeah. that they're talking about. Um, and I, I actually went and found most, but not all of the papers they mentioned. And I didn't, I didn't read them. These are really geeky papers. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I connected them into the brain. Um, so I, you know, so I kind of have the nexus of things that they're talking about in a way. Uh, yeah. 
And then you're on your phone right now, right? So you probably can't see text from my, from my brain if I share screen. You're breaking up on me again. My computer second. Oh no, can you hear me now? Yes, now you're clear, but that last stretch was bumpy bumpy. I didn't say too much. Okay. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, so okay. now you can watch it on your on your other device. Cool. Record um, progress. Good. Okay. Perfect. Cool. So, are you seeing what I'm sharing now? Let me see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I turned off my cellular. Maybe it's the Wi-Fi stronger. Well, that's probably true, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm looking at your brain. Okay, good. Um, so I put in a bunch of things like, uh, no part of a car is derivative of human experience. Mm -hmm. uh, which data set you choose matters to mm -hmm. train these systems on, uh, but machine learning engineers often use the data that is most easily available, which I need to connect to that thought. Uh, it's really hard to recall a bad hammer, but you can just turn off an API. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. And then up here, they mentioned a, a paper called Critique and Contribute. That's this one. Then there's the 1993 paper called Greater or Lesser Statistics by the guy who was at Bell Labs. Um, and they started with algorithmic bias and a bunch of things around that, which are really interesting as well. So I, I did not know about third-party AI algorithm audits. So everything, mm -hmm. everything here is new. This is, yeah. you know, I knew about software audits kind of, I knew about algorithmic bias, but I didn't know that there were third-party firms that were starting to, to do an audit. That was really interesting. Yeah, I thought that was so fascinating. I put that in. And then, and then one thing I know because I have some background in AI, uh, I've never been a coder, but I used to be an analyst in the field. Um, the problem is that mm -hmm. neural, ne neural networks, so to, to brutally over oversimplify, there's a bunch of artificial intelligence that has rules that look like English. Mm -hmm. and so 5% of the time when somebody shows up with sniffles and a cough, but if they also have this other symptom, you might have tuberculosis. That, those are rules. Neural <laughs> networks are just trained on data sets and they don't actually have rules inside. So mm -hmm. when they make a recommendation, all they're doing is pattern matching and they can't tell you why. Mm -hmm. And worse, if the data is full of bias, like, hey, we're gonna feed it a bunch of lending data from some cities. Well, if those cities yeah. were redlining or if those cities included bias against minorities for lending, then guess what the algorithm is going to do, right? The pattern, yeah. the pattern is going to replicate the bias that humans already exhibit every day in, mm -hmm. you know, in systemic bias, basically. Yeah. Um, systemic racism and all those things just show up in the data. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. And I think I'm going to pursue that when I story thread this. I'm going to talk about that some. Yeah, I thought that was very fascinating when Deborah said, um, she said it's something around the around the lines of there's you use rather than considering what which data would actually best support this decision, you're just pulling the data that's available um, or what has been the standard thus far, yep. and so not thinking about could this data have bias. And that was such a <laughs> strange eye opening when Chris said, yeah, like the mind years ago was just, it's data, it can't have bias, like it's a fact. And right. to think it's still in the hands of people. <laughs> it's not, it, and even the facts are recorded or form, formed by people, so. And also the people sometimes have bias. So the place I think I was gonna start because they started with, um, 
they started kind of with some of like, it's, it's not camera bias, but image, like a lot of image processing algorithms don't perceive black faces well. And that's mm -hmm. been a problem. And that, 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 ha that kind of bubbled up a couple of years ago. But the, yeah. thing, the thing I was gonna show people is that in the world of image processing, the the default the standard image that they moved that they moved around is this one, <laughs> and this is a Playboy Playmate image. Her name is Lena. Her name is Lena actually, and it, it, her name is actually Lena Söderberg. Um, this is a standard test image, and this was when when people were when researchers, almost all men, were doing image compression. That's the image they were working with, just to show you like what a boys' club this was, kind of forever. Um, and so there's clearly bias baked into lots of different places, lots of different corners of what's but, happening here. Yeah. And then I've got this connected to how can we keep AI from being a threat, which is kind of the, the, the bigger, the bigger piece of this. Um, and then that could also bridge over to um one of the oh, where did I put that so one of the, so I've got uh, the thought about what are the common threads across the different conversations across these different sessions so here here's how I've been storing the common themes across these sessions uh hold on a sec there we go so deep listening coping with crises algorithmic bias healing from trauma, and what should we do right now to create a better future? These are the, the threads that I've got so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that feels, that feels really, um, that feels very true to a lot of the different conversations that we listen to. And it's, I found that another, Another interesting pattern I saw throughout, I was reading through some of my different notes from, from talks and it was kind of, I think because of the, the doom, and the, the, like the impending feeling of midnight, um, there was this conversation around like staying in motion and being in motion to not be stuck and to keep energy flowing, not just through us for healing and like things like dealing with trauma, but it was also this like, if we're in motion, at least change will happen versus feeling stagnant or stuck or depressed or things like that. So yeah. um, that kind of motion of energy, and I don't know if you saw my Tracy Ryan's um, map, but it was the water currents through the ocean system, the yep. hot and cold currents. And um, that idea, not just of like his conversation of chi and moving energy through the body and um, processing out trauma, but also it was like the, the way to find hope or, or a glimpse of hope was, was in processing, slowing down, processing personally, it ties into the deep listening because it's all about kind of how do we slow down our systems to actually be aware of what we're doing um, and how we're acting and how we move forward. And that even feels relevant to the Chris and Deborah conversation around like, how do we slow down and see what is this system, what harm is this system doing? How do we regulate it? How do we move forward in a better, more thoughtful way? Um, but that thoughtfulness and that idea of deep listening and dealing with trauma, it all is like, looking inward and facing ourselves before we can help others, yeah. um, which it's so much easier to problem solve for other people. <laughs> so, I know, I know. Um, but I think, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna have even more difficulty with finding true solutions and listening to others if you aren't listening to yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I also just passed the part in uh, the Chris and Deborah conversation where they talked about how these algorithms are always in motion as well. And so, mm -hmm. and so, you know, if you're in, a, in an accident, we can figure out which model Pinto you were in. And there's like hundreds of thousands of that model Pinto. Yeah. But, but here it's like the algorithm is always updating, always changing, and may even in fact be very custom to you because of your own variables and all that. And so figuring out 
what to fix. And when you make a claim about something that broke, oh yeah, but we fixed that in rev, you know, two revs back. So yeah, how do you find it? How do you fix it? Who's, who are you gonna sue for what, for what part is really interesting. Uh, but, but then yeah. also just back to your theme of motion. I think there's like eight different kinds of motion that have come up in, in these different talks, right? Um, in, including kind of in the Buddhist session, more about the like Vipassana, what happens when you stop all motion and when you try to slow your brain down and what shows mm -hmm. up then, right? That was really interesting. Because, and I think that ties, it ties in perfectly with the, with the idea of deep listening, because what you're doing in that you're intentionally pausing motion to sit still for a set number of hours. Um, but by subduing or by, by halting one act, like f physical action or even speaking, you're I feel like you're becoming more attuned to others and so that brings up kind of all this internal motion which is why we often run into high speed to avoid that intern internal motion so um yeah I thought that that was really fascinating because that it was a pause but it's actually just activating a different a different a different motion within us uh, which which can truly lead towards some of that um healing and fresh perspective and processing of things but the one reason we avoid that is because as you said you're literally taking everything out of the closet and trying to just put back the good things but it's like the closet falls in on you when you slow down that much <laughs> you know everything out and um but yeah I think that, I think that the interesting thing is, especially that conversation left me with was that so much of the work is so, so often we're not doing the internal work before trying to help others and put on your, put on your that, that, sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that kind of felt like some of the roadblocks that Vir, Virginie was running into because people were just pushing their ideas so much they couldn't pause and listen. But um, I think if you pause and listen, then you can kind of tell maybe the core of some of these ideas is actually the same and we're just going about them different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but it is complicated when you bring in people with all different opinions and thoughts. So yeah. Um, yeah. What were some of the other types of motion that stood out to you? Um. So what you just said reminded me of my old boss, Esther Dyson. Um, mm -hmm. So Vanity Fair did a piece on her once, a profile of her, and they interviewed me for it. And they quoted me as, as describing her kind of as a shark. And mm -hmm. I didn't mean like Shark Tank. And that was, that was before Shark Tank, I think, even was a thing. Um, yeah. what, I, what I meant was Esther was in perpetual motion and, and really couldn't stop. She booked her days where she didn't drive. So she always would approach somebody to drive her from or to airports and she was always traveling and so those were briefings like somebody would would offer to pick like okay good i'll i'll take the ride out to dfw and then i'll get to pitch my <laughs> my startup uh, but <laughs> her days were very very tightly booked and then she you know she'd book time to write a piece and she had this incredible focus um but but it felt like if she ever paused for introspection she wouldn't like that so she she didn't didn't make room for that i think on purpose yeah. there's a there's a piece of that 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 accompanies what you were just talking about and I, I thank you for reminding me of the the metaphor of pulling everything out of the closet and then putting back in only the things you want that was that was special um yeah and then there's also all this this other um there's also this general motion that change is happening so fast that yeah. that we're in an era where everything is moving so quickly um that you know, do you need to run fast to keep up? And and April just wrote a book where the first of her eight superpowers is called Run Slower. Mm -hmm. And she quotes, she quotes the Navy SEAL saying, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Right. And one mm -hmm. of and in, in, in terms of the dangers to our democracy right now, one of the bright spots for me is what's called uh, deep canvassing. Have you heard of deep canvassing? Yes, yes. You you mentioned this earlier or yeah. in the previous. Yeah. So Stacey Abrams and uh, and others 
are basically saying, hey, don't just knock on the door and leave a pamphlet and like, like ask who you're voting for, slow down and have like a 45 minute conversation. And that's much more likely to change somebody's mind, which is great because yeah. relationships and trust building to actually take time. And so there's this weird, there's this weird feeling I have that things are really, really, really urgent, that we don't have a lot of time left on the midnight clock. Talk, if you talk to people who are way deep down the climate uh, rabbit hole, um, they will tell you that this thing is hard to turn and may not be turnable, et cetera. Yeah. And, and then I think, wow, okay, good. That means we have to do something fast and a lot of it. But if it involves humans, chances are we have to do that slowly. Yeah. Right? If it involves yeah. putting iron filings in the ocean or sulfur particles or sodium particles in the atmosphere, fund it, put it up there and try not to destroy the earth, right? You can do that at the pace of engineering. But yeah. anything that involves humans and voting and, and whatnot is just going to have to slow down in the face of crisis. And that, that's going to be really, really hard. Yeah. That's going to be super hard. I know, especially when some of the population has such a sense of urgency around it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I know looking up what the exact um what it was in Italian, but have you heard the phrase festina lente? It means make yes. haste slow. That reminded it, me of what you were saying just a minute ago with that idea of like how do we yeah, how do we keep pace and also be thoughtful? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And how things so exactly. Um, yeah, I feel like that, that idea of, I think, I think the Vipassana and the like sitting, meditating and slowing down also um, in that conversation, it was so fascinating how they were saying like so much of that actually like reminds us that we're not alone and shows our connectedness when we slow down and what, I mean, not, not just through like Tracy's vision of his mother, but, um, but even through healing with trauma and really working through things um, that Brother Fulfillment was talking about. But I feel like that idea of when we're running at such a speed, we can feel really alone um, because, because there isn't that time to pause. Right. Um, and you feel alone in your, in your rush or in your speed of what you're doing. So um, it's interesting that actually in slowing down, even though we're in a midnight <laughs> crisis state um, is probably the best way to actually truly connect, which resonates with the deep canvassing and everything as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's so interesting to figure out how, what does that look like on such a big scale, um, especially around the climate? Um, yeah. And when you're, when you're in motion quickly, when you're moving fast, everything's blurry, you're hard to pin down, like all, yeah. all the other things are hard, hard, harder to do, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the thought of how each, well, some talks didn't directly discuss midnight as a topic, um, but those that did, it was really fascinating to see the difference between there were very few that seemed hopeful about it, but some, some did and thought of it more as like a new beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really resonated with the Jess and Ida conversation around it because it was like this time zero, like this, it could be the beginning, but it's also kind of feels like the end and it's just darkness and you're not sure when the light's going to come, but you think it will come. And that, um, they said, believing that the light, that the light is coming feels abstract and like a willful exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought that was so fascinating because then thinking about that as the first talk that we listened to, and then the, um, Tracy and Aaron talk was kind of a practice of a willful exercise to be present and take note of those things. So, um, it was neat to see some of those overlaps and people who are like, their discussions were actually about very different topics. Right. Um, you're reminding me also, of, you, you just said, you, you, know, you don't know if the light is coming. You're kind of like hoping the light is coming. <laughs> the it's, light right now. Exactly. As, like as, as, the light, 
as the sun is setting on you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, um, I know. But only I today, only today, this is not the vast metaphor. Um, <laughs> but it, it makes me think also of the piece that I was story threading in about the new story, like we're missing a new story. And one of the things mm -hmm. that gives people light is a hopeful story. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and part of the problem here is that we're missing uh, not a uniform story, but but a reasonable story that paints a future that we might actually be able to to like survive into together and thrive in a future yeah. that sounds a little bit better than than we expect or than than realistically people are are, yeah. are coming now. Um, and so I'm 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 perpetually interested in what are the stories people are offering that do engage that kind of hope, and in contrast the different kinds of crazy stories that people are weaving um, that are destroying all yeah. of this. Like, you know, like the, there's a really good article, I, I don't remember if I mentioned it in one of our calls, but um, QAnon, um, a guy wrote, a gamer, a game designer wrote a really nice piece that said, is QAnon an alternate reality game? An AR mm. And if you look at QAnon, there's a mysterious host who keeps dropping messages, which have plots and things to do and then, and then the, it's like, holy bean dip it looks just like yeah. an AOG, right yeah except this yeah. is a, this is a life and death arg that's actually affected a whole bunch of people and shifted yeah. their behavior dramatically right yeah that's, that's really really interesting because that's a story too it's a it's, it's a set of nested stories that are busy mm -hmm. like causing chaos in the world yeah i know yeah the stories we tell are important <laughs> They really they connect or divide people and that's what i think i think in the um virginie conversation i think i was looking for and we discussed this earlier but looking for like a new direction or a different approach or next step towards how do we bring people together over climate change and actually take action and i think that she was her approach felt much like the make case slowly like she had she had great hope that something that change could happen quickly once the story is agreed upon yeah. and the once the story is a is vocalized in a way that people can connect to grasp onto feel a part of and and so sometimes it's just you want there to just be one quickly and it's like how do we find the right one before even approaching the public with it, which is so, so altered to so much of our, every idea you have you put online immediately yeah. <laughs> mindset, right? So mm -hmm. um, that like slowing down in thoughtfulness, but also with a sense of urgency, is just, it feels in, uh, in pull with each other, you know? It also felt like Virginie, um, and I may have this wrong, but it felt like her audience or her posse or her, the circles she was busy thinking about these important issues with were all mm -hmm. at the policy abstract level. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that they were, they were kind of in this policy dance, this long-term policy dance that wasn't yet resolving things that is like having a, a, a nice week, this week in COP26 in Glasgow. Um, yeah. But, but that that wasn't the, the, the native story that ordinary people are going to pick up and use and do, right? Yeah. I, 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 she felt to me like she was operating a, a couple of levels or layers removed from normal people's lives and stories. Yeah, yeah. But it felt like it was a um, building block. Like it was all of these people who are maybe running a lot of the organizations that are going to be involved in some of the major steps of climate change um right. mitigation is is kind of where the story needs to start and then we can explain how everyday action is involved in that um but i don't know yeah those, those bigger the bigger concepts like that are just so fascinating because it's everyone is like trying to approach it in their own capacity and how they can and <laughs> um it makes me think of the Tatiana and Diana conversation with um, their ideas of, well, we are living in one world, even though we're trying to build and aspire to a better world, but 
there is this push and pull where we can't totally step in or out of one. And it's not just, they mentioned cowardice, but I don't think it's as much cowardice as like one system where actually most of the world is functioning in. And it's like being an early adapter. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, there is going to be tension. Just how do you have a healthy tension where you are moving forward and not staying in a system that is not, that is not progressive. That is not working. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking at the quotes I I wrote down from their session. Mm-hmm. Down, we don't know as humans where to put our collective trust. Um, yeah, the idea of um, trust was really fascinating, and trust almost as a currency mm-hmm. that that we individually have the highest value of so like there's so to think about every so much of what we're advertising and um in in life is actually like they're asking for our trust and it's our choice what we're giving our trust to um yeah i thought i don't really know where i was going with that thought but i just thought that that idea was really fascinating as trust as a currency um that we actually hold the power to. Cause I think sometimes saying like, oh, but you have, we have more power than we ever think. And sometimes I feel like my only power is <laughs> voting and recycling. And yeah. I'm like, what, what is, what else is there to do? And I, and I, I think thinking about it in that way, how do I, it is often challenging, but how do I, how am I proactive in like every decision that I'm making is actually supporting a company and a cause and things like that um and integrating that more that thought pattern more fluidly into yeah every and and early in that session tatiana says hey there's a whole bunch of people out there who don't trust big pharma and don't trust big government and here they both come and saying trust us you must do this and that doesn't that doesn't that doesn't go over very well that that kind of stopped me um and then and then back to the Pasana and Tracy and all that, um, a lot of that was about trusting yourself, mm-hmm. inner work, mm-hmm. finding your way back to the things you could trust in you or about you, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that was really fascinating because um, Brother Fulfillment, Aaron Solomon, who was speaking with Tracy, he his conversation about stepping from behind the robes um, and his position as a monk was really fascinating because he, it was that I need to be known for my action rather than for the symbol that I represent. Right. Uh, and I think, and he made a good point to say like, we often need a physical representation of something that we're aspiring for or a mindset um, or vision of how we would like life to be. But, um, but being in that position, he actually had to step out of it to like, for a simple term, it's like practice what he preached, you know, like how do you actually just live and be known for the way that you live? And that, that call, that leads into all that internal reflection that you're talking about too. Was, was there a piece in there that he thought that the saffron robes might misrepresent him as he became more of an activist? That, that No, I think no? he spoke that no um because a lot of his activism was in was when he was yeah. before he unrobed so and was aligned um, with it well hmm? and was aligned with it well with uh with being the buddhist monk mm-hmm. okay. yeah yeah um yeah it wasn't fully like nonviolent protests that they were doing when they um were bringing it was it was around climate change actually but bringing like the ship into Times square and all of that and walking in handcuffs and and he actually got arrested during that yeah. protest um but yeah i think that 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 aligned with what he was passionate about as a in freedom and taking care of our world and everything um, but yeah i think the the idea of stepping from behind the robe was more of a personal step. How do I, how do I just be known for what I believe rather than, um, 
Yeah. I thought, I thought his story was really interesting. It was only touched on, you know, in that first part of that conversation where he really spoke, but it was also around the idea of our, our position and the way that we can help um, in the world and be show up for our own lives can shift so much right. um, and, and have seasons. Um, and I think that that shows a fluidity that some of that motion that we're talking about where you don't have to stay like locked into one identity. And then even in the Ida and Jess conversation where you, you grieve even like expectations about yourself and who um, identities to then move into, into others. Um, it was interesting because I think a lot of people can get stuck in kind of a rigid, a rigid expectations. And that actually is not only limiting to yourself, but also, um, the potential of who you can be in in his position, like stepping into this role of um, not only relationship, but kind of a whole new phase of life and also being in a position where he's surrounded by people, not in a monastery and able to like to take a lot of his learning to um, process people through trauma. It's really fascinating. Yeah. And also. Um sometimes the wrapper that you're in distracts people or turns people off. Mm -hmm. So to reach more people, yeah. stepping outside uh, the robes allowed him to be like a normal person. And, you know, yeah. people will listen to normal people and people who won't listen to a monk might actually listen to a, another human. Yeah. I know. Cause we all have expectations of, and assumptions and bias <laughs> based on our own histories. Yeah, so, exactly. yeah, that was a really fascinating thought. Cool. Huh. I also, I also felt like the idea of, um, it has to do with the motion that we discussed earlier, but the, uh, the conversations around neuroplasticity, I feel like that actually came up in a few different discussions. Um, but I feel like it perfectly aligns with what we're what we are saying, which is that it, that openness, the like willingness to process and work through things, which is deep listening is a part of, um, and the rewiring being being open, willing, and even intentional to change, um, and that that and that there is a hope in change because because of the motion and the way that our bodies can heal and reconnect. So I thought that idea of neuroplastic, the neuroplasticity like popped up a few different in a few different conversations. And um, I found that as interesting to be a common thread, but it, it feels aligned with a lot of the other topics we've discussed. Me too. If we broaden it a tiny bit to be social neuroplasticity, hmm. does that work well too? Cause, cause I think, part of your genie looking for what are, what are the right messages to change us, et cetera. So there's this kind of, we're, we're busy trying to figure out what to do next about these problems. We're trying to figure out what are the new patterns of behavior and belief. Yeah. In sense. And neuroplasticity is usually referencing one skull and one set of neurons, you know, trying to rewire. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, I think we're, we're also like both, like definitely the, the, the ones inside the skull, but somehow also, all these, all these other things. And there's a, there's a book I haven't finished reading that's a favorite of friend, friend of mine. It's a handbook or the field guide to interpersonal neurobiology. Hmm. And it's kind of about like what, what happens to us electrochemically when we talk and when we're in a relationship and when something yeah. happens. And it, it feels like we're, we need to figure that out at a, at a global scale. Yeah. I know. How do we rewire before midnight? <laughs> or after midnight if midnight's already happened <laughs> yeah 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 and then there's so, people like jen ben, <laughs> then there's people like jen bendel who are saying hey we need deep adaptation because we were we've already messed things up so badly that yeah. earth is going to be far less uh, hospitable than it has been so we need to do we need to take larger measures to make sure we survive and manage to you know get by yeah and that's that was a um in kind of a this is the end of civilization conversation that Doug um, Rushkoff mentioned. It was very much like what drastic next steps are, are what we need to do to move forward through this. Like, how do we deal with the, um, 
the the crisis of immigration and and people being having to move across the the world and country and who is going to take the people who are moving from uninhabitable spaces and then also the idea of um, how do we move towards food sources and kind of recenter ourselves in a way that will work for whatever is coming next. Um, and I think that the, the resistance against change out of fear of it shifting normalcy is like the, the biggest roadblock because yeah. we, because there's a comfort in rhythms that we're familiar with, but it's clear that that is, that those rhythms are unsustainable. So how do we shift our mindset personally and as you're saying socially um, to adjust for the coming doom? <laughs> I know we, we need to end on a on a on a happier note. Uh, and we humans love our ruts. We just really love our ruts, and we love our yeah. habits, and we love our uh, Digger. we love familiarity, right? Yeah. Um, and part of the problem here, or part of the opportunity, ha. Huh, is reframing these new worlds as as positive as opportunities which is what virginie did with her kids mm -hmm. to plan their next life right yeah to involve yeah. them in the planning you like crowds, planning. crowdsource the plan for for the future yep what what do you want and how do we how what are our steps to get there um, yep. and i I do think that the, I think that the hopeful aspect of this is the connectedness yeah. and it is like, and I think that the shift from into like the globalist mindset that we've been in, um, in the, in the past time is just, it's it in that way, it's positive because there is still some very fierce nationalism, of course, but the, if we can view others with with care and or at least with um an ownership over like global health and the people that the other people that live in the world yeah. then i think that that connectedness is how we actually move into any any next phase of um of growth and yeah. future yeah. open yeah. Change, positive change so um yeah i love that yeah well one of my friends he's in a lot of ogm calls uh, he's doing a lot of what he calls positive cartography mm -hmm. and he's trying to bring people together yeah. to, to do that to draw maps of positive futures hmm. and what that looks like and he's working kind of at all ages and all that he's uh he's in holland so yeah. you know northern europe and all that but it's it's interesting it's and and you can see how drawing positive maps of a wish a, de a desired future might actually be helpful yeah I know. And I've actually, I've actually done that in, um, or had like therapists tell me to do that and done that in at different stages of my life, life too, when going through something difficult and feeling hopeless and saying, okay, what are 10 positive futures? And let's write, let's write a short story. Let's write a paragraph about each one, because I think the sense of opportunity and the sense of like, there are forks in the road that lead to more forks in the road is hopeful yeah. because it's not, I'm on one path and unless I f completely turn around, there's no changes coming up. And to remember that we are like in this forked path that will continue forking and there are continued opportunities um, is to shift and change. And um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's very fascinating. I have, the the word Tim Shell tattooed on my arm because it, it's around the power of choice um, from Steinbeck's book, but um, but it's also like every choice we make sets our life course a different direction. So every day there's opportunity for that versus um, we've made one decision and that's that's where we're going. And that sense of motion and um, positive motion is was a thread throughout all of these. So such resonance i just had the conversation the sentences you just uttered i just had that conversation an hour ago really know, about the choices we make in our lives and uh, you know the four yeah. or whatever it's really it's really cool repeating motion see these conversations are happening everywhere it's true it's true <laughs> we all have to connect over them <laughs> midnight is in the air yeah. yeah oh well i've really enjoyed 
working through this process with you. Same here. And, um, I'm excited to go look on the conversation boards and see how this is resonating with other people. Um, because I think that a lot of these topics are so, they are so communal and they are, um, as you said, like so many people are thinking about the same things and we're just eager to, to discuss and figure out what, maybe what are those, what are those possible positive cartography yep. <laughs> features for ourselves? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Thank you for all this. This has been a gift. It's been, um, and just, just the chance to slow down and talk about the sessions afterward with you has been super helpful. Really great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for putting up with the dogs and birds and other things in my current environment. So. <laughs> and the sun is apparently set. So there you go. The sun set. I know it sets early here. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I hope you have a good evening and um, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, let's talk more. Um, and then I'll definitely plan to maybe meet up and have a conversation when I'm in Portland too. Sounds great. Sounds okay, good. have a good night. Thanks, Emma. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.